Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Brandy Muller Reed, and my pronouns are she and her. And I will be your service leader this morning. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principle and drawing from many sources. We do hope you feel welcome here. Whatever you believe or do not believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. Please join us after the service for coffee. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakata Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwa, Salto, Ashinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. And now we'll start with a prelude. So, so announcements? Thank you. Good morning. Do you like my hat? Well, goodbye then. So when, um, when my kids were little, I used to read this story to them called Go Dog Go, and there's a line in the, in the story, and it, uh, one dog says to the other, do you like my hat? And the other dog says, no, I do not like your hat. And then so the first dog says, well, goodbye then. And he says, goodbye then. So we're going to do that because it's really fun. Do you like my hat? No, I don't like your hat. Well, goodbye then. <laughs> my name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison. It's my pleasure and honor uh, to serve this congregation, this Unitarian Church of Edmonton. And I delight in doing so. And it is wonderful to be with you this morning. I have some announcements. Um, first of all, if I think everybody is kind of together at a table, but you might want to spread out a little bit because we kind of have even numbers. It doesn't have to be even numbers, but please don't be alone or maybe just with someone that you're really super close with. It's, there's a lot of interaction in this morning's service. Um, so if you have a ghost story, ghost story that you've personally experienced, these are the stories that we're going to be hearing from. Um, I'll one in one session section um, Alara Stefanik Day will lead us off and in the other I will lead us off and then we'll just with a show of hands to tell your ghost story your real ghost story that something that happened to you personally uh, just put up your hand and we'll we'll call you up and um, make it semi brief although I know with my ghost stories it's a long story but a um, few things happening this week. Uh, Wednesday night is both the uh, writer's workshop here in the library with uh, Reverend Dr. David Fedeke, and it's also the first of this year's um, UUs on tap, a uh, different location, different day, different time, six o'clock uh, at Three Vikings on 124th. Check your newsletter or your weekly email it will have all that in it this weekend is a big weekend for the cuc they have developed they've been working on for a very long time uh, a collab they're calling it and we we're, we're hoping for some um, interaction and some some participation a thing went out on saturday to everyone about the collab so you can click on that and get some more information um, let me know if you don't get the weekly emails uh, then you wouldn't have gotten it but um, we're hoping to have a group of people do the collab together here on Saturday. So the Friday evening one, we're asking people to, if you want to do that one, to do that one on your own at home. But then we'll do it together here um, in the boardroom, I believe, or yeah, in the back boardroom, we'll do it together. Um, 
Have I forgotten anything? Yes. Okay. This is the Lara Stefaniak Godet. They, them pronouns. Yeah. Oh, testing. There we are. There we go. So about the collab, there is also out a podcast which came out with the same email called UU Expressions, which our staff have put together, Amber and Aaron at this UC, and it is fantastic and insider training. If you get a chance to live, you don't have to, but if you get a chance to listen to the podcast before collab, you'll have you'll have some groundwork and if not you'll still have a great time at the collab and i'm also going to announce that our online soul matters group is gathering tonight on zoom at 7 pm and a bunch of us are going to get together and have some pizza and redo our theme board and that's going to be fun so if you're interested in pizza and theme boards and having some time to connect because your soul matters you can come talk to me This evening at 7 p.m., this evening at 7 p.m., here in the sanctuary, I'm going to be leading a quiet contemplative service um, with music, um, poetry, deep sharing. So our theme of this month is deep listening. So our practice this evening um, in the candlelight um, is deep listening. So in order to have deep listening, we need to have some deep sharing. So there'll be candle lighting sharing, listening, music, poetry, quiet, contemplative service in the round here this evening at 7, and I will be leading that. Thank you, Karen. Okay, that's a lot. Yeah. I was going to say, lots of great things happening. Next is our chalice lighting, and I forgot to ask someone, so I'm going to put somebody on the spot because they put my orange Halloween t-shirt to shame. Um, Declan, would you be so kind? Because I feel like this needs to be seen. Thank you. <laughs> I did. We kindle this flame as we approach the dark time of the year, remembering the promise of life abundant of a possible peace. We pause on this day of mystery to tell the stories, to sing the songs, and to bring more light to the world. Thank you, Declan. Our opening hymn this morning is 1023, Building Bridges. The text has magically appeared behind me on the screen, so please stand as you are willing and able for 1020. We have our Time for All Ages, Poltergeist by Eric Geron, illustrated by Peter Oswald. So we're telling spooky ghost stories, and so I have a spooky ghost story about a chicken. And they've entitled it Poultry Geist. 
Okay, so there's a chicken crossing the road, and guess what happens? There's a semi on its way. Bam! The chicken got hit by the semi. There we go. What happened? I have a hat on. Well, what's the last thing you remember? I remember crossing the road to get to the other side. Uh, and you mean the other side. Isn't that what I just said? Anyway, I remember crossing the road to get to the other side like I always do. And, ah, you mean I'm, I'm fried, yeah, roasted, yeah, cooked, and in the soup says the alligator. What we're trying to say, chicken, is that you are now a poultrygeist. Say it with me, poultrygeist. Ah, oh no. Oh yes, a noisy troublemaking ghost, chicken, which means it's cockadoodle boo time for you. Yeah. Time for you to play dead, then twist your head. But I, I'm just a little spring chicken, or I guess I used to be. Am I in anybody's way with this hat? All right. It's time to get foul, foul. Can't, can't I be a friendly ghost? No. Now that you're a ghoul, it's your turn to someone's to turn someone's sunny side up into sunny side down. Can you see the pictures or do we need some lights up? We're good? Okay. But I don't want to haunt anyone, especially not innocent readers who are just trying to enjoy a nice story about an unlucky chicken. Psst, are you okay? Don't be such a chicken, chicken. Yeah, don't be so weak in the beak. Ghosts of a feather haunt together. Show a little pluck, pluck. Hatch a scheme to get a scream. I may be a ghost, but I will not haunt anyone. Nothing you do or say can ever change that. And besides, I'm not even scary. I guess maybe he is. Was it, was it something I said? <laughs> well, oh well, they're gone. I don't like the ending of the story, so I'm about to make one up. <laughs> oh well, they're gone. I guess I get to be a friendly ghost chicken after all. The end. Oh, I like this page. I like this page. It's a little little squirrel with its little acorn heading across the street, the road. He too is getting to the other side. Let's hope he has a better chance than the chicken. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, we will now do a sharing our abundance. One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. In addition to supporting this community, we also make monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of all unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. For the month of October, we are supporting Camp Firefly. Camp Firefly is a fun, educational, social, and personal leadership retreat for 2S LGBTQ plus youth age 14 to 20 that takes place at the YMCA Camp Chief Hector in Kananaskis. Campers explore their identity, build resilience, enhance self-esteem, and develop leadership skills that positively impact their lives, homes, schools, and communities workshops, outdoor activities, mental health support, art programming, and community building are just some of the examples that they 
participated. For those in the sanctuary, you can use the envelopes found inside the cover of the hymn books if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift. Please indicate on the envelope your contact information so we can send you a tax receipt at the end of the year. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal for their accounts. For those of you online, we encourage you to visit the Camp Firefly website to make an off a donation. for your generosity of spirit and action. Through all we do here in this community and the wider world, we are involved in this important spiritual work of creation and compassion. Join us in singing from you I receive. So now it's time for the service leader reflection, and I thought, oh boy, do I have a story for you guys. So <laughs> one night I'm walking home alone, it's a dark and it's a rainy night, and my path took me past the local cemetery. And as I passed the gates, I heard a strange noise in the darkness behind me. I couldn't dare look back, so I quickened my pace, but I heard this bumping noise behind me. I stopped and I turned around really slowly and coming down the road behind me, standing on its end, was a coffin, bumping side to side, bump, 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 bump. Terrified, naturally, I couldn't believe my eyes. I turned around and I ran into the driving rain. Behind me, the coffin came faster and faster, bump, 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 bump. As I passed someone's green bin, I threw it into the street at the coffin and hurled it, but the coffin just tipped it over, righted it, or the coffin tipped over, but it righted itself and continued faster. Bumpity bump, bumpity bump, bumpity bump. Finally, I turned the corner onto my street and I ran through the gate, the coffin right behind me. I tried to slam the door, but it crashed right through and the coffin lid swung open and I glimpsed the hideous skeleton inside. I threw a chair at the coffin, but barely slowed down. I ran upstairs as fast as I could, but bump, clomp, bump, clomp, bump, clomp behind me the whole way. At last, desperate and scared, I ran into my bathroom, locking the door, knowing it was only a matter of time and it was probably useless. Sure enough, the coffin banged on the door, it had me cornered. Bump, 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 bump. The coffin came smashing through the door seconds later, and desperately I grabbed the first thing on my bathroom counter I could find, and I hurled the bottle of cough syrup directly at it as it broke all over, and the coffin stopped. So now it's time, I think, to tell your spooky stories. So. 
<laughs> Spooky story time, number one. Yeah, yeah. Spooky stories. I got to just shout out to Doug, who did the slides this week. Awesome job. And I threw a couple curveballs at him late in the week, so, and he handled them really well. So I've been trying to think about the story I'm going to tell, but I think because I'll just tell you the one with, it involves teacups. So I moved to Victoria. I've moved to Victoria twice and rented a place to live, and in both places, there were ghosts. But I'm going to tell you about the most recent one. I moved to Victoria in 2010. I rented a little apartment in a building that was, had been built as an apartment in about 1905. And it was right across the street from the bent mast. I could look through my window into the, the bent mast. I heard sound go down. Am I, can you still hear me? Um, and, so, and so I could see inside, it was a pub, uh, and it was um, considered the most haunted building in Victoria, for sure, and maybe Canada. So I loved my little apartment. It was so cute, until the ghosts found me. And uh, so what they would do is they would come from the bent mass, and they would come into my apartment. This is about the second or third experience with different ghosts. But it was a group of them. And in this little apartment, I, had all my, I have a teacup collection. And in my kitchen, I had all the teacups lined up on top of the cupboards. And they would come in the door and start to dance. So they, I guess they decided there wasn't enough room in the bent mass to dance in. So they would dance in my kitchen. And I knew they were in the kitchen because the teacups would chatter. Every single one of them would be like that. And then they would move their way into the bedroom and start to dance in the bedroom. And I knew that they were in there because as they passed my vanity, there was a mirror on the vanity and there was a bolt loose. And as they passed the vanity, the, the mirror would go and they would dance around in there and then they'd leave. And I'd hear that, and then they'd go in the kitchen, and I'd hear all the teacups chatter. This happened to me night after night after night. I went and talked to the people at the Bent Mass, said, are you guys getting haunting? Of course they are, because it's the most haunted place in probably all of Canada. They told me about things flying through the air, and little girls crying on the steps. And, finally, and I went to the coffee shop down the street, and I said, are you guys getting ghosts down there? Oh, of course we are, because this is James Bay. And um, so I said, what do you do about it? And they said, put out a bowl of... I was exhausted, to be honest with you. I had gotten to the point where I was like, I can't take this anymore. So they told me to put out a big bowl of sea salt. And so I put out a big bowl of sea salt, and it stopped. And then I took the sea salt and I took it to the ocean. I was about a block and a half from the ocean. Put it in the ocean and I never had ghosts again. And I moved. <laughs> There's so many stories in that area in James Bay of ghosts and um, moving things and throwing things. Um, I have other stories, and I, but of course, it is not, no longer my turn to talk. Uh, would anyone like to tell a spooky ghost story? David, I invite you to come and uh, say your name at the mic and um, and they, they know to bring the cameras there. Thank you. And if you've got another, if you've got one, we're going to hear we're going to hear at least one more uh, in this session. Oh, okay. Um, you can't see this is a ghost story, but it is sure an odd thing. Uh, this happened back 44 years ago in 1980, 
Uh, I was spending the summer in Ontario, or at least a month. I was an officer in the militia, and I was taking a couple of courses uh, at the, the army base at Petawawa, which is about an hour and a half north of uh, Ottawa. Uh, I'd been booked to take the course for quite a while. When it came around time to head down there, it was a little inconvenient. Uh, my wife and I owned a white Samoyed dog named Niska. And uh, Niska was about eight years old and was ailing. We'd seen a vet and it seemed to be a heart problem, but it was hard to really get an analysis of it. Uh, however, uh, the situation didn't seem dire. So we talked it over and it was agreed I would go on my course and my wife would handle anything to do with um, the vet and the dog. River. Uh, we were under canvas. Um, it, we had a little sort of area set up where we um, slept under tents, had a mess kit or a mess hall and um, an officer's mess and other delights. And um, for the, the first two weeks, everything went well. It was what we call the gentleman's course. Uh, no slogging through swamps, carrying heavy rifles and other military equipment, none of that. Um, so at the end of the first two weeks, it was two separate courses back to back, we, um, I, I got a call from my wife and uh, where I'd, actually I was phoning fairly regularly to check on the dog. And she said, well, he seems to be deteriorating. He, he goes down to the basement, lies down, and he doesn't come up much at all. So this was worrisome, but uh, she checked with the vet, and he didn't have anything to say. Uh, so uh, that weekend, I went down to Ottawa to see a couple of friends, uh, take a bus service they had down and then bus back. I got in rather late. It was quite late, quite dark out. And I had to make my way about a mile and a half past the Petawawa Army Barracks and then down a hill to the Matawa Plain and across to our tent encampment. All was dark there when I arrived back. Um, everybody sacked out early. And I found my tent. I was, uh, because of my rank, I had a tent to myself, which was nice. And I got in. Uh, we, we had, I don't know if you know of them, they're a, sort of a pressure lantern that sprays gas onto a mantle. And then you light that and leap back, and you've got an intense bright light. And so I lit my lantern and you, hung, you had it hanging or you picked it up and put it back hanging. And um, I spent a little while getting ready for the next day when we were going to have another course starting. And then I got undressed, got into my sleeping bag I left the lamp on because I wanted to do a bit of reading for a while, and maybe about five or ten minutes, and then I turned the lamp off. Um, of course, there's a, with the, those lanterns, the light is pretty intense, so you've got a light in your eye for a while, but then that faded and I was in darkness. But then, towards the top of the tent, I could see a glow. It, was a, it seemed to be about a little less than a foot and not a circle exactly, but um, sort of football shape or something. I wondered what the hell that was. 
I uh, looked to see if maybe my lantern was still projecting a bit of light, but that was not so. So it was very puzzling. It didn't, it wasn't pulsating or anything. It was just a glow, but it shouldn't have been there. So after a while, I got up, turned my lantern back on, and we had to pump it a bit to get the pressure up and hold the match in and then leap back, and then you had light. And of course, the glow disappeared. That was funny. So after a while, I turned it off, went back to bed, and once the light in my eyes had faded, and I was testing it by this point, I'd look around. Well, when, that, when you've got it as sort of an impact in your eyes, when you look around, it's still there. It follows you around. This didn't happen with the glow that started again. I looked over. There was nothing there, but there was this puzzling light at the top of my tent. I guess I went through about uh, three or four more cycles of getting out, turning off my gas light, seeing what, what was happening, and always once the gas lamp was off, I had that light at the, the top of my tent. Now, I'll run through a couple of things. One, it wasn't some guys walking along, turning their flashlights on the side of the tent. That happened when guys were finding their way in the dark, and always it was on the side. Uh, secondly, it couldn't have been pranksters because we had what we call a fire picket, troops out through the night patrolling. This is especially important when you've got tents can, can easily cast fire. It couldn't have been uh, a light from a far distant airplane. I've seen that. Uh, it, it's, it couldn't have been that. It couldn't have, I've, somewhat later, I actually was on a ground party for a helicopter doing a medical evacuation, landing and then going up. There's nothing like that, especially not the noise and the wind. There was just no sign of anything except this funny light. Eventually it faded out and I quickly fell asleep. The next morning, uh, just around breakfast time, the orderly officer came his wife phoned a couple of hours ago, so she'd have been up pretty early. And the message was, your dog died during the Devastated. I was really up, and I was crying off and on, and uh, also I was thinking, Jesus, the guys are going to think I'm a real wuss. I mean, this was an infantry course. These are tough people, not crybabies. So I was expecting I was going to get heckled. Instead, I got a lesson in compassion. I had guy after guy coming up to me over the morning. Dave, I've heard about your dog. Very sorry for you. The, the peak of it was this one guy on the course. He was the toughest, meanest looking guy. In my imagination, I always used to think he'd go around with a bayonet clenched in his teeth. He comes up to me, puts his hands on my shoulders and says, Dave, I'm so sorry to hear about your dog. I know exactly how you feel, fella. When my little Moxie died, I was crying for a week. Well, we also had a rarity uh, on the officers on the course. There was an ordained Anglican priest, but he wasn't there as a padre or any religious. He, he was there as an infantry officer. Civilian, he wasn't working with the church. He was a counselor on something. But that, that night we get together and have a couple of drinks and talk. And to be quite honest, I really appreciated it. And as I say, I got a lesson in compassion. The next day, I phoned my wife, and uh, I was beginning to wonder about something. And I said, "Well, where was Niska when he died?" She said, "Well." 
he was down at the bottom of the stairs. So I says, was the light at the top of the stairs on? She said, yes, it was always on during the period he'd been down there. I got thinking, and um, I'll point out here, I've been a Unitarian for uh, about 60 years now. Um, I've listened to a lot of people give their views on existence and life and so on. So I'll specify. Um, I do not classify myself as an atheist, an agnostic, or a deist. I do not um, buy into any revealed religion with a direct pipeline to the deity. Uh, follow religions. So I was trying to pu puzzle out this thing. And about all I could come up with was, well, the dog was lying there dying, could have been reaching out to me somehow in its mind, and across 2,000 miles, uh, telepathy, getting through to me? No. Option was it possible the dog died, something of its essence? A, um, a ghost, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, that was showing up for me. I have no other explanation. I will add that um, in the two weeks before, in the two weeks after, I never saw that light again. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Audrey has, oh, but I need it to be like, Okay. We have a lot to get through this morning. So if you have any plans between 11.30 and uh, 12, cancel them. My name is Audrey, and this is a two-minute, okay? My mother uh, was, Hung is, was Hungarian. She died in 2002. And we have in our Hungarian background gypsy blood. And you can tell because I have the gold circle around my eye, which is a characteristic of a tzigan. And in the family is the second sight uh, or extrasensory perception. And my mother was the kind of person that would tell you things that were going to happen, like, don't marry that guy, it's going to be bad, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, we were sitting in the kitchen this one time, and we had planned her memorial service because she had... Um, uh, heart problems and we knew that she was going to die. We were sitting there and of course there was the clock and we we're having tea and uh, she said of course that she would be a Unitarian if it wasn't for her husband. So we talked about life after death and uh, I said to her, Mom, uh, because of your, your extrasensory perception, is it possible that you could let me know if there's something on the other side? And she, we, she looked at me and she thought, yeah, and I said, well, what would you use for a sign? And she looked around the kitchen, she saw the clock. And she says, well, she says, I'll let the clock fall off the wall. So this is 2000, before 2002. So about five years ago, I'm in bed, it's, it's after midnight, and I hear this crashing in the kitchen. I go out to the kitchen, it's not the clock, but it's the uh, oak um, bell for the door. And I, I'm surprised because she said clock and it, you know, but mother was temperamental. It could have been a, a doorbell because I'm her daughter. Anyway, uh, so I put the thing on the table. The next morning I get on the chair and put it back up. Next night I go to bed. It's after midnight. The damn thing falls off again. And I mean, this is loud. It just hits the, the, the floor. And by this time I'm a little anxious. I live on the table, and I, next day I put it back up. The next night, it falls off again. I'm in bed, half asleep. The damn thing falls off the wall again. By this time, I'm thinking, Mother, you have a weird sense of humor. It was supposed to be a damn clock. So my son comes over, and I said, Jay, this is what happens. But he said, Mom, that damn thing is about, was in the house since 1954. He said, it's probably the rusted clips on the thing. And he put it back up there, and it never did it again. But the question is, 
Why, at the same time of the night, for three nights, did that thing fall off the wall? Thank you. Am I muted or unmuted? I am unmuted. So um, my script tells me that we're going to sing a song, but we're not really going to do that. Because I really want you to have a chance to do um, the mystery activities. The first mystery activity is mystery activity number one. And it involves the die, dice on your table. And it's kind of like, has anybody played Magic 8 Ball? Yeah? So Magic 8 Ball is you ask that 8 is a ball with a kind of a, a cloudy window in it, and you ask it a question, and then you shake it, and then it gives you an answer corresponding to the number. So what we are asking you to do is pair up with someone and or do it yourself. So you're going to ask the dice a question. So you're going to grab a dice, a die, two dice, one die, and you're going to ask it things like, will I true love? Will I get that promotion? Am I going to be rich? Am I going to be beautiful? Am I going to be loved? I don't know. Whatever is on your heart and mind, you are playing a fortune-telling game right now for yourselves. Okay. And the key is up here. So if you say, I would like to, um, am I going to find true love? And I roll a six, well, then the answer is yes. We have activities going on up here. This half of the room can't see all the answers. Oh, thank you for, uh, for organizing that. Um, and if you get a four, switch dice with your neighbor, and so their answer is now your answer, and your answer is now their answer. All right, and then my favorite, number five, what are you thinking? Ask a different question. So we're going to just play this game for maximum of uh, five minutes. So ready, set. Uh, and of course, I forgot to tell the folks online that you needed a die, but I did ask the greeters to let you know, and I hope that that happened. So uh, if you've got a dice in the house, go ahead and play this game with, your, with yourself or with someone else in the house. Ready, set, go. I want to hear those dice. Got two minutes left. I'm going to skip the spoken. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And um, so we're going to go. 
I am, am I muted? Yeah. Is it say mute? You're not, you're down, down but they the could hear me if it doesn't say mute. Does it say mute on here? Okay, wind it up for finish up your your rolling. Okay, we're going to um, wind up this activity so that you guys can have lunch at a reasonable hour, and uh, we're going to sing through twice. Return again, hymn number 1011, the words will appear on the screen. Return again, return again, return to the home of your soul. And it too is a, a round and it's got a whole bunch of parts, but we're just gonna sing this one part this morning. We're gonna sing this through twice. Karen, thank you. It is our custom on every Sunday morning to light candles of joy and concern. Um, I invite you to come to the table. The candle stations are ready for you to light a candle, whatever is in your heart. Maybe something has happened in your lives over the past week or year, and you need to acknowledge that by lighting a candle. The tables are open. I invite you now. It does say spoken, but because we're, we've got a, um, of course, I overplanned. And so we'll just light candles this morning uh, un, without speaking to them. And then I'll put that into an, a service in the very near future. The tables are open. You are invited.
worries and concerns that we hold dear in our hearts and minds. I'm going to get the text script. Yes, Alara knows what they were doing next. Thank you, Alara. Appreciate it. Alara helped me. Um, Alara is the co-creator of this service. They and I planned it together, and it was a joy working with you. Yeah, this was a fun one. All right, so I have a story that is a true ghost story. I was 18. I had just graduated high school and taken a train from here to Nova Scotia to visit family on the East Coast for the first time. Little be notes to me, I ended up living there and loving being there for three years. But the first year that I was there, I was living with an aunt and an uncle in Truro, Nova Scotia, and I was living in their basement suite where my cousin, who I thought was the coolest person on the planet because he was in a band, was living prior to me. And the setup of this space is important. So there was the basement, which was kind of like a divided room where there used to be two rooms. And the basement on the one side of the room was where my bed was. And the other side of the room was kind of just like storage. And my bed faced a staircase of like six or seven stairs that went up into this half landing area and a laundry room. And then the whole basement was painted black because my cousin was in a band and he thought it was cool. <laughs> and on the wall on the other side, so like the storage side of the basement was an old black and white photograph that he had gotten at a garage sale at one point. I didn't know anything about this photo. He didn't know anything about this photo, but it was an old black and white photo of a group of people. So I'd been living there maybe a month or so. And one night I was sleeping and I got woken up by whistling at the top of the stairs. And I woke up and I thought, oh, my aunt's trying to wake me up. I must, it must be time to go to work. And I kind of like stumbled out of bed and I looked at the clock and it was like 2 a.m. and there was nobody in the landing. So that happened maybe three nights in a row. I would fall asleep, I would go to bed, I would get woken up by whistling at the top of these stairs that my bed was facing and there was never anybody there. And then it escalated a little and I would wake up and there would be whistling and there would be these like four or five lights that I couldn't explain dancing on the wall on my side of the room. And then the fifth night that something happened, I was falling asleep like I was asleep. And the spookiest part of this was that I got smacked in the face and woken up by getting smacked in the face and it terrified me and I switched bedrooms to my other cousin's room upstairs for a while. And I kind of just like sat with this. And every time I would go downstairs, I would get woken up either by these whistling or getting smacked in the face. And I finally kind of like thought, maybe it's this photograph. I have no knowledge of this photograph. And I took the photo down and I put it in a box and I put it in the garage and it took me a while to get my courage up to sleep back in this basement. But after I had done that, every time I would walk by this box, I would get a creepy feeling, but I never got woken up again. Yeah. I would love to. So we have a second mystery activity and I'm going to encourage you there's two tables of three people. I'm going to encourage you to go together because this is going to be more fun with more people at a table. The two tables in the middle, can you just combine tables, please? Right here. Three people, three people, come together. Move over. Okay, so we're going to play with our tarot cards that are on the table and oracle cards, but you will notice that I took out the books because I don't want us to spend five minutes reading. I want us to spend five minutes engaging with each other. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask, we're gonna buddy up to pick a partner, preferably somebody you don't know as well. We're gonna buddy up, we're gonna ask a question, and then I have an example card here. So rather than, 
and it can this is the opposite of the dice this is not a yes or no question okay so not a yes or no question so i might ask what's my fall gonna look like and i just drew this card that is the six of swords and the image on the card is a boatman going down a river with a lamp and a mask on and going to the threshold. So to my partner, I'm going to say, oh, maybe I have a mask on that I need to take off. Maybe that's what this card is telling me. So I'm, I'm gonna get you to use the images on the card to tell like two sentences of story about how that card connects to the question you asked the card. And that's what we're going to do. So if I asked how my fall is, I'm going to say, uh oh, I need to take a mask off because I'm trying to cross a threshold with too many swords. And if I take the mask off, maybe my vulnerability will come through. That's what this card is telling me. So that's what we're going to do. Five minutes. You got five minutes. The cards are beautiful. Use those images. Buddy up. Thank <laughs> you. 
can see amazing and wonderful engagement with these cards, these oracle cards. I do need to bring you in. Yeah. I will add that if you would like to continue with the cards because they're fun, we can leave them out after the service and you can come back to them if anybody hasn't had a turn. Thank you. Um, we will be uh, singing our final hymn, We Shall Be Known, uh, written by a group called Ma Muse. It's not in a hymn book. Um, it's got a nice little beat to it. If you'd like to rise in body or spirit to sing this final hymn. And yeah, aren't we playing it? Okay, Alara and I will lead it. We're going to sing it a cappella. And I communicated that poorly. I beg your pardon, Karen. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth it is time now it is time now that we thrive it is time we lead ourselves into the well it is time now and what a time to be alive in this great turning we all learn to lead with love in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love pick up the pace just a tiny bit we shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle round to tend these fires we shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive, it is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead with love. Thank you. That was awesome. And next time I'll be clearer about what we need. <laughs> okay, you're way over there. I'm way over here, but, oh, can we... You all hear me? Okay, perfect. Dan, please, can I ask you to extinguish our flame again? Um, lots. I'll forget somebody, but thank you for everybody who helped in the service, both online, with coffee, with the uh, um, sharing our abundance, and of course, Declan, for extinguishing the flame. We extinguish the challenge here that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light your path as you leave this place. May it guide your way until we are together again. Thank you. And in words of benediction, let's just say together, it is time now. Let's try that. It is time now. It is time now that we are. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. And now we will sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. It's going to be harder with all of the tables, but we can do it. There we go.